the best way of thinking about architecture is just put financial considerations on one side while you're thinking about it. Do your designs, then get it costed. Don't cut your cloth before you need to. Business of Architecture UK, episode 23. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Super special announcement here on Thursday 11th of October 2018. The Business of Architecture UK will be having its next live event at UNI offices at 7A Hoek Place. We will be having a live panel discussion with some of the UK's leading architect, entrepreneurs and industry thought leaders where we will be discussing making money, profit, cash flow and impactful architecture. Now, early bird tickets have just gone on sale. They are at 50% below your regular price, and you can get the link, which will be in the info section of this podcast. So those are only going to be at the early bird 50% sale price for a few weeks. So make sure that you go and book your place now. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. This week I'm speaking with Francis Terry of Francis Terry Associates about his practice. And I really enjoyed this interview with Francis. He spoke very um, intimately about a number of topics, including how him and his father... um, Quinlan Terry, how they separated their ways and, uh, you know, established their individual practices. Um, he talks about some of his work uh, with counter-proposals, um, some of the controversy around the Chelsea Barracks, and he goes into a lot of depth around classical architecture, its relevance today, and the business models that he uses to operate with this kind of vernacular form of architectural design. It's a really fascinating interview. There's just a huge amount of of business wisdom um, and entrepreneurial interest here. So I really hope you enjoy this interview. Good afternoon and welcome to the business of architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and I had the privilege this morning of speaking with Francis Terry of Francis Terry Associates. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Pleasure. Now, Francis is one of the UK's leading classical and traditional architects, and you were working originally with your at your father's practice. That's right. Quinlan yeah. Terry. That's right. And yeah. was it two years ago you began your own practice? Uh, yeah, just a little over, yeah. Yeah. And so can you tell me a little bit, how did, how did that begin? How did this practice begin? Um, well, my father is... Um, now 82, um, and there was a feeling that one day I would take over the practice. Um, and I think the trouble is that architects base their succession planning on lawyers and accountants who don't really enjoy their job. Um, and I think it's very difficult for architects to relinquish responsibility and I'm sure I won't be any different Mm. Uh, it's a pleasurable job and you can do it into your 80s into your 90s Um, and um, well for example Foster is well Foster and Rogers they're both uh, and uh, Hopkins Hopkins, they're they're all in their 80s late 80s some of them Uh, Grimshaw um, and I I think the whole issue of succession planning, because it's based on people who don't enjoy their job and they just, lawyers think, I get to 65, I'll be gone. Or if uh, if I work really hard, I get to 60. But architects aren't like that. It's more of a a life, it's like being an artist. Yeah. And you want to do it forever. So I had this, this tension in my father's office where I wanted to have my own practice. And... Really, the signs were very much one day you will have a practice. And as I was um, in my late 40s, I just thought, this isn't going to happen. Um, and I, my father was aware of this problem and, and sympathetic. Um, and we tried to do a, a revised partnership agreement where I would take more control um, and this went back and forth with mm. lawyers and so on. And we, we never 
we just couldn't, we couldn't really meet in the middle because I would be taking over the practice and he would have to be stepping down. Yeah. And that was just not something he wanted to do. And so I just thought, actually, I don't want to force him to do it. Um, this is his life. This is his passion. But I've got to, go, I've got to leave and I've got to take the clients I'm working on mm. and some staff to do my projects. Um, so I just changed the conversation to that's what I want to do. Um, and initially my father was, was quite amenable to it because he could carry on doing his work. Um, and I think I probably was becoming a bit of a pain, to be honest, <laughs> <laughs> by wanting to take over. And so I thought, ah, oh, relief, a solution. Um, and that's, it all, that's how it all seemed to be going, and that all worked quite nicely. But the trouble is, when you leave a practice, you have to take all the money that you've invested in the practice out. Mm. And when that started to happen, and then actually I did need to take my clients and staff, it, it did get quite unpleasant. Mm. Um, it was like a divorce. Yeah. You know, lawyers involved. Uh, and it was, it was really, it was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty unpleasant for both of us, mm. actually. Uh, and I wouldn't... You know, I, I think, I mean, if you just forget that period, um, which, which was really tough, um, and fast forward to now, we now get on much better than we ever have. In fact, he's coming to supper tonight, yeah. uh, which is a reflection of that. And I think when I was in the office wanting to take over, he found that difficult and threatening, mm. um, and which was bad for our relationship. Uh, he's now got his own practice. Um, he employs as many people as me. Uh, he's got lots of staff. He enjoys it. He's mm. incredibly healthy. Um, and um, all's well, it ends well. Yeah. Um, but I have seen, I've got friends who are architects. And I mean, there are two approaches when you get to that stage of uh, waiting for the, um, uh, the senior partner to move on. Um, some people buy the practice and people do this at a huge amount of money, you know, hundreds of thousands. Mm. And I've, a friend of mine's done this and they've, they've bought a practice for a lot of money and they've got this huge debt, which they're going to have for years to come. Basically their profit will go to the partner's family for years to come. Mm. And it, it just seems so tough. And also, architecture isn't like law or accountancy where basically tax returns are tax returns and you just have to do them in a particular way. Buying a house, you just have to jump through certain... Who Obviously, it's very difficult. I wouldn't know how to start. But mm. um, architecture is a creative thing and it's based on individuals, um, particularly mine and my father's things. And I suppose what I found difficult about buying into my father's practice, which I effectively avoided doing by setting up my own practice, was I was actually buying myself, it mm. seemed, um, because I was in increasingly I was um, seeing the clients, I was getting clients. Um, and I just thought, why am I doing this? And it, it would get very sort of confusing for people. Um, yeah. Wow. That, and that, yeah, and uh, I, I've never really considered it, the kind of the, the relationship strain that kind of going through that process would have actually put on you two. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's... And also, uh, the, other, I mean, the other reason I did it is um, I've got four sisters um, in an extended family uh, you know, the, the people will say, oh, you were given the office. When in fact, it's far from given it. I'm building up my reputation. Mm. I'm working every day. And I, I didn't want to feel I was given it. Yes. Um, so there was that too. Um, you know, and also people sort of crack jokes. So, you know, I mean, my father wasn't going to retire, retire. So, you know, was I waiting for him to die effectively? Mm. And And people sort of, 
I don't know, every now and again, someone might crack a, a kind of disparaging joke of that nature, which I just didn't want to be in that position. Mm. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I do feel sorry for people in family businesses. I really do. Um, because it's so confused with inheritance, with waiting for your time, love and respect for your parents. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I think it worked back in the day when people died at 50. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, it's interesting with our generation, well, my generation, you're younger than me, but my generation of architects, it might, I don't know whether it'll be the same for yours, maybe different, that we're, we're a silent generation. There are no eminent architects of my age. Mm. And you think that generation of Foster, uh, Rogers, Sterling, Grimshaw, um, they all made it in their 40s. So there's going to be, in the history books, mm. there's going to be those 80-year-olds, Zaha Hadid, and then a kind of a nothing. Mm. Because, it, well, you know, even firms like um, Wilkinson Air, mm. there, I mean, there's a whole load of them. And I think a lot of people my age are, I think we're, we're quite a nice generation. We don't like to rock the boat. We're not like the 60s lot. You know, we're not out competing. We're, we're not... We're just gentle. Mm. And, um, and that's my nature too. But um, so I think, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think that it will be an interesting to look at it because basically, well, you've got Rogers, Sterk and Harbour, but Rogers will stay there until he dies. There's no question of that. Yeah, okay, you probably know what, more, more about that than I do. But um, I read with interest that, how that was being done, but there was nothing that say that he would ever stop. Mm. And, it, and it is, it's, it, lots of architectural practices, there was a lot of challenges facing many architectural practices when you've had this kind of charismatic, you know, leader, how to pass on to the next generation, and how to, you know, create your own marketing, how to create your own message, how to create your own a new identity and not always be living in in the shadows of, of that old, True. Of, that, of that character. True. And I think that is another critical thing. Mm. Like, m my father and I are very different people. Yeah. He's um, very conservative, very religious. Mm. Um, and I'm neither of those. And I very much wanted to have a practice that reflected me and my personality. Mm. Um, and I'm... And I, I mean, I, I like modern architecture too. I, 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 I mean, I've just done a kitchen in my own house, which is completely modern, because because I just think kitchen soup being modern. Yeah. Um, that's my taste, you know. Yeah. So, I suppose I didn't really want to. I didn't want to be, people to make assumptions about my beliefs based on my father. Um, so that was actually quite a big issue yeah. for me. And quite a, and it's quite a, you know, I've been seeing people before who have had family businesses, and like you say, there is so much emotional charge in yeah. that, and also a younger generation wanting to be able to make their own and not kind of be, you know, uh, piggybacking or be yeah. seen to be piggybacking. Absolutely. And, kind Absolutely. Of, and also your own voice, your own ideas, your own uh, yeah. expression yeah. Is, is really important. I mean, actually setting up this office is, it's pretty much the best thing I've done really mm. in that I, 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 you know, I can, I, I have all that and I'm rethinking everything, um, you know, that um, the old office was very slow to adopt computers. We, we only got um, any form of CAD in about 2013. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And, well, that's another story. But, <laughs> that's um, amazing. Yeah. So it was all drawing boards. All drawing boards until 2013. Yeah. Um, and I, I absolutely love CAD. Mm. Um, I can't use it, um, but I think its potential is fantastic. And I also think it really suits classical architecture. If Palladio would have would have loved CAD because <laughs> it's all, you know, it's all cut and paste. You've got the orders, five of them, mm. put them in. Um, it's all proportioning up, proportioning down, repetition. You know, yeah. two columns look great, four looks better, six looks... And, and so it goes on, you know. Um, and the options you can see, um, yeah. 
and, and the thoroughness of CAD as well, mm. I, I love. Um, so, yeah, and I also enjoy... Um, I enjoy the clients designing their own buildings to a certain extent because they know what they want. And, and clients are, are very intelligent nowadays. And they, um, they've they done their research. And they usually have a little Pinterest board of things they like. And I get a lot of pleasure out of... you know I, I, I used to um, paint portraits a lot. And... If you, when you paint a person, you're looking to see exactly what makes their face their face, mm. which is in a way much more interesting than just painting an imaginary face. Mm. And I, I think there's a parallel with architecture that there's a lot of pleasure in thinking, this person likes this, this and this. How can we get it absolutely how they want mm. so that when they go into their house, it's just seamless, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, so that that is my my take, which is actually quite an unclassical approach, and very much um, when I worked with my father, it was very much we have a look, we have a style, it's Palladian, and to a certain extent, people have to sort of fit into that. Right. Um, yeah. Much more sort of a, a kind of stricter, dogmatic approach. Yeah. In many yeah. Ways. Absolutely. And and again, I think that um, it's to do with the time that people. Were around. I mean, my, when my father started, um, people were very hostile to classical architecture. They had very negative associations to it. Mm. And that modernism was bringing in a brave new world where, you know, classical architecture was associated with two world wars and all the carnage of that, that mm. traditional ideology had given us that. And everyone was looking sort of post-60s to a, a new ideology when all these things would... would uh, would change and and classical architecture was associated with all that. Um, Do you think classical architecture still retains some of that? No, I, I, well, I think it does in some people's minds. Yes, older people, but I think now, um, I think now people are interested in ornament. Um, you know, whether it's uh, decoration of clothes or tattoos or whatever it is, people ornament is something people don't want things clean and white there's mm. and there's um a love of well it's like the kind of hipsters uh with their home brewed beer from specific little warehouses and that kind of cottage industry which yeah. sort of chimes with traditional architecture um is fashionable mm. um i think there's been a bit of a postmodern I don't know if sure there's been a postmodern revival. I don't think there has really, but people are interested in what Fat did, that the house that Grace and Perry did. Um, uh, there's a couple of books have been written about postmodern architecture. I think people are thinking um, there's a certain style of modernism which everyone sort of does. I don't want to sort of name names, but there's a kind of. <laughs> Uh, it's basically Allies and Morrison yeah. that everyone does. And, you know, kind of well done to, for Allies and Morrison for inventing that. But people are thinking, oh, you know, there must be more to life than just this sort of, you know, is it kind of like the planners like it, the architects can do it. And it's just, uh, uh, I think some architects where it's all, it's all just sewn up, mm. all they're doing is choosing colours because, you know, regulations, mayor's requirements, blah, 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 has all just determined everything. And I think people, I think whatever you think about fat, um, what they actually produced, um, I think intellectually they're really interesting and something refreshing. And I, 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 I suppose doing classical architecture now, people, people are interested in mm. that, you know, that you actually know how to do these Roman and Renaissance forms correctly. Yeah. Uh, and um, the arguments behind those, and, you know, what, what a Palladio ionic base moulding looks like as opposed to a, I don't know, a Vignola Corinthian or mm. whatever, you know, to, to have all that in your head ha has a use. Um, and how, how does knowing 
the uh, kind of expert, having an expertise in classical architecture, how is it trans? How does it change your practice? How does it, in terms of the the kind of services that you offer to a client? Yeah, um, I. Like what is your? Yes, I, is I, your, I I completely get the question. I think that. Architects often bemoan the problem that um, our work is being taken away by uh, project managers and interior designers and all of this. I, I welcome it. I think that what our skill in this office is classical architecture. Mm. And we know, we know that inside out. That's our thing. We don't have the interest in contract administration bathrooms to the same degree there's other people in the world who do it better and I, I ac absolutely welcome that so instead of viewing this problem of the erosion of what architects do as being a bad thing I think it's great mm. and I also think that architects are creative people they like drawing they like vision and so on project managers are, are a different animal they like mm. putting things in boxes they like closing problems down and that makes a good project manager. Probably doesn't make a good architect. Mm -hmm. And we've architects. I think it's because of the term architects. Uh, you know, God is architect of the universe. That we we have this inheritance. Maybe it comes all the way from I don't know Vitruvius or somewhere. That an architect does the whole project. But if you think about it, some of the best buildings couldn't have been done in that way um, until the twentieth century. Architects couldn't attend regular site meetings. If they designed something more than five miles, I mean, more than 10 miles away, they'd probably rarely see it ever mm. again. Um, I mean, traveling was massively difficult. People didn't move out of their own, own horizon. Even, well, even in London, getting from, from the East End to Pimlico would be... I, I was reading about this in, uh, in a Victorian uh, biography recently. That was like... A major trip that you know that you would do you know once a year um, so uh, architects traditionally you, well you would you would employ I mean it varies from project to project obviously Christopher Wren was massively involved in St Paul's and did what the modern architect does, and more. Yeah, um, he he was involved in absolutely every aspect of that. But um, you know, I'm just thinking of other examples. Um, so for your for your practice, where is your stage of work essentially? What, so when well, you win a project, what is it that you? How does it differ from like you were saying from from a different? You, you're not involved in the contract administration well, elements. No, I mean I think. If you take the three stages, there's the planning, yep. um, working drawings, site. The planning, I always do use a planning consultant. I have, <clears throat> I've never, we, I mean, in this office, we'll never fill up a planning form. Mm. Um, and so I make sure I have a landscape designer. I'll have an influence on it, but they know more. I'd also like to get an interiors person in right day one so that, for example, superficial point but the height of a window make sure that the curtains fit yeah um so that i don't have to go back to the planners you know if they're very fastidious and say sorry they've all got to drop by a certain amount um so i like to get all of these people in early um and I, our bit is is the building the the wrapping we'll we'll have um, an influence on the interiors but i like to do it in collaboration with an interior designer will also have an influence on the garden, but that will be a conversation with the garden design. Mm. Um, and the planning, the, the person who leads that stage um, is not me, it's the planning consultant. Right. Because there's so much tactics and knowledge of planning law and precedent and changes in planning law, which most architects haven't a clue about. Like the new NPPF has just come out. Mm. I don't know. I don't know an architect who would have read that. But every planning consultant would have read that. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, in order to get the best... It's about delivering the best thing for the client. Um, so, I, I, you know, the more you have... So at that stage, let it be run by the planning consultant. Then 
The next stage, which is the working drawing stage, um, I we can obviously do the whole lot, and obviously you have to have um, M&E consultants, uh, structural engineers, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I welcome the interior designers' input at that stage because they re they spend their life looking at bathrooms, the latest technology with bathrooms, um, bath sizes, curtains. Let's get all of that in as early as possible. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with that. Uh, moving on to the construction phase, um, we don't do project management. We don't, it's not an interest of mine. Um, and we employ um, project managers who are relatively recent invention uh, to do all that work for them, which they're extremely well qualified to do. Mm. It also, I slightly feel if an architect is contract administrator, they're slightly marking their own homework, <laughs> which, you know, um, it's better that you have an independent person to do that. Um, but there's always an innate uh, conflict of contract administration because you're as an architect you, you are the independent professional but the reality is for the majority of the project you would have been employed by the client yes yes and so you're always kind of kind of there is already an existing relationship there with with the client and you and you wanting to deliver you yeah know, the architecture essentially. exactly um and, and i suppose what i think is i'd like to deliver the architecture untroubled by all of that mm. you know i I actually think the best way to thinking about architecture is just put financial considerations on one side while you're thinking about it. Um, do your designs, then get it costed. Don't cut your cloth before you need to. Mm. And I think the trouble is if, the, if you've got an idea, a mind on the costs, and also the history of the costs, um, you know, the client may want to change something at a later stage, and you can say, well, we can do this, 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 and this. But if you're contract administrating, you're thinking about the extension of time, you're thinking about this, mm. and you're not really thinking about the architecture. Mm. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable. Thank you again for listening, and don't forget that those early bird tickets for the next Business of Architecture UK live event are now on sale and you can get those by booking online in the link that's in the information of this podcast. Look forward to seeing you there.